Good morning. Good morning. Happy first week of Advent. Thank you so much. We're all so glad to see you here this morning. We wanted to take a moment to thank our guest musician today, Evangeline, who will be playing flute with us later. We're so excited to have her. She went to college with Chris and I, so we're so excited to hear her play. So we thank you very much. All right, let, please rise as you're able, and we'll start with Light of the World. song this morning. We'll sing How Great as our postlude. Again, we'd like to welcome you this Advent morning, and we'd like to welcome forward Steve and Kathy as they light our first Advent candle. Good morning. In the days of exile and uncertainty, the prophet Isaiah cried out, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, 
so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As the fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down and make your name known to the enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. We wait as people surprised us again and again by God who shakes us out of our complacency and wakes us up to the work of the kingdom all around us. We light this candle as a sign of our shocking hope. May we stay awake to God's activity in the world as we wait in expectation that even now God is with us working to restore us to the fullness of life with God and to one another. Please rise as you are able for Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. be seated. You've already been able to hear some of God's words. We take those words, many of them, throughout the worship service to hopefully, the key word there is hopefully, bring us closer into the presence of God's spirit. So in this time together, we try to engage our hearts and minds in an attitude of prayer. I would invite you to join in singing a very appropriate call to prayer for this season, Emmanuel, Emmanuel.
merciful Savior, the longings of our hearts are deep and profound. And in this season of Advent, like no other, we are made acutely aware of our yearnings. While we are surrounded by glittery tinsel and pretty packages, we are reminded that superficial things just really do not truly satisfy. Our calendars become crammed with activities and events. And honestly, Lord, those calendars expose the lie that busyness often means purpose. The to-do list runs off the page, yet exhaustion, exhaustion, not joy, is too often the, the end of achieving everything we set out to achieve. We are surrounded by crowds, but feel the emptiness of our connections to others. What we genuinely desire, Lord, is a sense of mystery, a sense of transcendence, a story that is bigger than life, but enfolds, encompasses our lives. We need the Son of God to become flesh again, the baby born in a manger who brought shepherds to their knees and angels to their feet. We long for a liberating truth that cannot be contained in words but truly must be sung by the heavenly hosts. In short, Lord, as we focus on this pastoral prayer, deep within each of us is a hungering for you. Come to us anew, we pray, not just today, but for the entire season so our restless hearts will be satisfied. Lord, we offer these concerns, these hopes, these desires to you, knowing that it was you who taught us to always pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to lift up God in the offering of our tithes and gifts, knowing that all that we have received has been a gift from him. The ushers will come forward to wait upon us, please.
rise as you're able for the singing of doxology. Yeah, perfect. Gracious God, here are our symbols of the gifts of time, the gifts of talents, the gifts of money that you have provided us. But most of all, it is the gift of life for which we're grateful. May we take all that you have given and use those gifts to continue to build your kingdom. This I ask in your son's name, amen. And you may be seated. The scripture lesson for today comes from the 80th, 8 80th Psalm, verses 1 through 7 and 17 through 19. It sets, or it gives us a setting to help us understand what life was like prior, prior, prior to God's intervention in the world with an infant. It's hard for us to understand. First of all, Advent is only four weeks out of the year, so we really whip through it. But if you'd lived for centuries, hoping that your life before it ended, you might see the promise that God continued to give. You might be able to capture again what it was like to be waiting. That's not to say that people today aren't waiting. They are very much like these words. Shepherd of Israel, listen. You, the one who leads Joseph as if he were a sheep. You who are enthroned upon the winged heavenly creatures. Show yourself before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Wrap up your power. Come to save us. Restore us, God. Make your face shine so that we can be saved. Lord God of heavenly forces, how long will you fume against your people's prayer? You fed them bread made of tears. You've given them tears to drink three times over. You've put us at odds with our neighbors. Our enemies make fun of us. Restore us, God of heavenly forces. Make your face shine so that we can be saved. Let your hand be with the one on your right side, with the one whom you secured as your own. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us so that we can call on your name. Restore us, Lord God of heavenly forces. Make your face shine so that we can be saved. 
May it be so for us as well. Of God's holy word. Wow, thank you, Evangeline. Thank you for bringing the flute to blend in with the choir of the angels. Thank you very much. And you all sounded very good too, by the way, just just so you know. Let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations that are on the hearts of all of us, O oh God, be acceptable unto you. For you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Amen. Restore means to bring back. You cannot restore if you aren't aware that you've lost something. It's just common sense. Bring us back, bring us back to a grounding. Bring us back to understand the meaning of life. Bring us back so that we can see a lantern that will light our path. What we know we need, and again, sometimes I say this, but it really isn't meant to be a political statement. It's to be meant to be a statement of life today. What we need, wherever you live, what we need is a sense of hope. We're inundated with everything, the information circuit of everything that's going wrong. And some of us know that even our very beings, our very bodies are, are struggling along the way. We know that without hope, there's not much that we can hold on to. We want to make sure that God has not abandoned us. We want to make sure that God loves us and is committed to us and indeed is among us. People are talking more and more, communicating anyway, more frequently now than any time in human history. We do that through the mobile phone but more and more, people are doing what I call my own personal opinion now, destroying my English grammar by texting. Have you ever read those texts? I'm one of the strange ones that literally spells out the words anymore. If I ask a question or make a statement, what I get back is not an O-K-A-Y, it's a K. When did K become a word? No, no. But I have to contain myself because it would be inappropriate for the pastor to say, would you please start spelling words correctly? We prefer the text because it's quicker. And yes, we will visit in homes with friends, but drop-in visits are a thing of another era. Take a look at the people on the street or in a crowded room or in a bus. Chances are that at least 50% of those people have some kind of phone in their hands and they're texting. Even now in this service that's going on. Showing photos, looking again, reading emails. And the kids, goodness, they carry on several conversations simultaneously and then we don't understand why they don't remember. Multiple messages pop up demanding instant responses and immediate attention. And, and somehow, it's not Big Brother as Uncle Sam. Everybody knows everything about me anymore. Cryptic replies are sent out at a feverish pace. And with texting, sending instant messages, which is now considered slow communication, there are obviously an increasingly numerous ways for people to communicate. But are they? Are they really communicating? The concept of FaceTime has taken on a whole new meaning. As I was in conversation this week with uh, Mrs. Frank Beard, Melissa Beard, the bishop's wife, 
and we were talking about her family, her children, adult children, their adult children, living out in Northern California now with grandchildren. And I said, so how often do you get to see them? Well, not very often. We've been out twice. And I said, so do you FaceTime? And she looked at me and said, that doesn't cut it. Right, you see a picture. And then she elaborated. And I said to her at the close of her elaboration, well, you just repeated part of my sermon for Sunday. Because you see, FaceTime doesn't cut it. We see the person, but we can't see the emotions behind the eyes. <laughs> we can't see the facial muscles responding very well. It's better than nothing. But let me ask you, when was the last time you had a heart-to-heart -heart talk where there was real give and take? Can you remember a conversation that was focused not on logistics or problem solving, but instead the conversation was an exchange of feelings, of emotions, our deeply held beliefs? Friends, we are wired by the gift of God to be in community with one another, yet we yearn to, and we yearn to be in community but the irony of our modern age of cyber-connected world is now we're becoming physically insulated. Endless conversations can take place in the seclusion of one's home. In this society where the word friend has become a verb shouldn't be happening. A friend should be a real person. But instead, it's how many friends or how many people have friended me. It may not be as popular as a face-to-face -face exchange with another person. But you see, that's how God created us to be. God gave us the gift of a human voice. And God expects us to use that voice to literally connect with each other. But maybe the first thing is that we need to consider Advent is a, is a time for us to spend with God. In our face time with one another, you can't do that with God. I mean, if you can pull up that, let me know. I would love to see how that works. But real time with God is something that's hard for us to schedule in. It's one of the reasons why I made sure that you had a devotional book, a free devotional book at the Advent pre-celebration. So you would really spend at least three minutes or four minutes out of the day having some honest-to-goodness time with God, quiet time with our Creator. Advent invites us to turn the life-draining pattern of run, 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 do, do, do upside down. Advent celebrates the incarnational word became flesh, God. Advent announces that God was not willing to have a distant arm's length relationship with us. Advent is all about God's willingness, even insistence, for each of us to become vulnerable, accessible, reachable, and attainable. Advent breaks down the barriers between the created and the creator. But it's going to take a recalibrating of how we spend our time. It means that sometimes we sit literally still. Still. 
and ponder what it means to be loved by a God that gave us life. The immensity of that love. As a surprise, I was not planning on it. A colleague, a young pastor that I had worked with as a superintendent came to me this week and said, I want you to meet my little girl that you once baptized. Now this little girl was nearly as tall as what I am. And this little girl just stared at me. She had never seen me to her knowledge, didn't know what to say. And finally her mother said, you don't remember the baptism, do you? At which point her daughter said, nothing, just shook the head. And so I proceeded to tell her about that day and what it was like Because not only was I representing God's gift of the Holy Spirit to flow through the water to this child, to this infant, but you see her grandfather had been a faithful United Methodist pastor in this conference with whom I had worked. No blood connection, but the ultimate connection, all being born of the Holy Spirit. That's what Advent does. It helps us to see that God wants to intervene in our lives. The psalmist says, restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. There are so many without hope. They fear being utterly consumed and lost. They feel alienated and alone. Perhaps you've never felt the weight of the word abandonment. It's a horrific, painful word. God came in the form of a baby to make sure that nobody would ever feel abandoned. And that's our role today. It's the people representing the Christ. A cry for a relationship, for personal interaction or face time with God is so important. The prayer the psalmist echoes, the hopeful yearning of God's people today, let your face shine so we may be saved. It's the call for people who are surrounded by technology but are still lonely for meaningful communication. It's the cry of people who may receive hundreds of texts every day, but still feel unheard. It's the yearning of the human heart, which does not want simply to be told of love, but needs to be transformed by love and hope. Nothing else will ever work. And hope, that which I lift up to you today, hope is found in the shining face of God. Let your face shine, pleads the psalmist. The question is for us, where do we see and experience God's face shining today? Where? Where? Well, we have to open up our eyes and we have to be able to see through the heart and we may have to feel and we may have to turn the remote off and we may, just may, have to find a way to connect with somebody that we've never connected with before. The answer to the plaintive plea in Psalm 80 is a resounding yes. God's face will shine upon God's people. Yes, God says, I will give you an ear so I can hear your cry. Yes, I will come and save you. Yes, I will restore our relationship fractured by your faithlessness and your sin. 
Yes, I will save you from neighbors who wish to destroy you. Think about that perspective in this global community where we live. Yes, my hand will be upon you. Yes, you will know the strength of the living God. Yes, we need a God who is our hope. And we have that. We have that, but here is the real cry for those who have yet to discover it, may discover that hope through you. Through you. Through a gentle touch of kindness. Through saying, look, I can't change what's happened in your life or what is happening, but I can be with you in life. Because that's who God is in the gift of his son. My gift, your gift, all of creation's gift. Come to save us, the people shouted, and God did. Defenseless as a baby, God continues to reflect love and compassion and that, that is the message of hope. Amen. Hope comes in many ways. One of them for we who are United Methodist is the hope comes through the sacrament of communion. It's a gift we United Methodists believe all persons are invited to have. So we don't put any limitations on it. If you are a member of this church, that's great. If you're not a member of any church, that's fine. You're welcome always to God's table. It's not ours. We just set the table for you to be fed with the gift of hope. So I invite you to Turn to the screen. To the confession and pardon and join with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. If the servers would come forward. and be fed at the Spirit's nudging.
It's powerful to partake of God's gift of hope. May it burn vibrantly in you this entire Advent season. And to confirm that, I would invite you to stand for the song of commitment. Please rise as you're able for 211 O Come O Come Emmanuel. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, 4, and 7. May the God of amazing grace give you eyes to see beauty everywhere and hearts to do good to everyone all throughout the coming week. May God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Please join me in the sending song, O Christmas Tree. The words are on the screen. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. Thank you all. See you next Sunday.